evening, everybody. I'm Fred Passman, and I welcome you to this evening's episode of Continental Commandery Naval Order of the United States um, Maritime History Virtual Lecture Series. Uh, before we introduce this evening's speakers, just want to say a couple of words about the Naval Order. Uh, first, that we are the oldest American hereditary exclusively naval society, and we are dedicated in the preservation and promotion of awareness of maritime history in the United States. And we do that through a number of ways, and to learn more, I invite you to visit the Naval Order's website or Continental Commandery's website in order to get that information. Housekeeping issue, if you have any questions during the presentation, you're invited to post those questions to the comments section. And when our guest speaker has completed his presentation, we'll have a question and answer session. With that, I want to introduce Dallam Masterson, our guest speaker. Dallam is a seventh generation Texan. Uh, and an admiral in the Texas Navy. And also he's a member of the Sons of the Texas, Republic of Texas. He's a retired geologist with degrees from Yale University and University of Texas at Houston with a PhD from the University of Texas at Dallas. Uh, he's fourth great grandfather. We're gonna hear more about as Dallam presents. So good evening, uh, Dallam. Good to see you. Good evening, Fred. Thank you for hosting this. So normally I ask, how did you become interested? I guess for you, it must have been just in your blood. Um, what inspired you to delve into your family history? What I'd heard about it some from growing up, uh, being born in Dallas, but it was when I moved to Houston a few years ago and met some of my cousins here, particularly my cousin Beth Fisher, who will help me answer questions afterward, that, I began to learn more about the history of the Navy and found it very interesting. So I delved into it. Excellent. Well, I know you've got a packed presentation. So rather than chit chatting much longer, I will uh, give you the deck and the con and ask you to go ahead and take it away. Great. Thank you. Uh, I'll put my slides up and let me know when you can see them. Are they up? Yes, they are. Great. Well, thanks again. Uh, it's an honor to speak to the Naval Order about my fourth great grandfather, Samuel Rhodes Fisher, who in this portrait is showing off his Navy regulation sideburns, which unfortunately, or, or maybe fortunately, I didn't inherit the ability to. This talk will show the crucial role that the Texas Navy played in winning independence from Mexico six and ensuring the survival of the Republic of Texas in 1837. Fisher was the founding father of the Texas Navy. He secured the purchase of the first Navy warship, Liberty, in November of 1835, then personally led its first action against the Mexican Navy. The Texas Navy's control of the coast prevented supplies from reaching Santa Ana's armies and diverted them to the Texian army instead, ensuring the Texian victory at San Jacinto. Then, as the first Secretary of the Navy for the Republic of Texas in 1837, Fisher ordered and volunteered for the Navy crews that broke the Mexican naval blockade that was strangling the young Republic. Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge these other contributors to the talk, uh, particularly uh, Admiral Beth Fisher, another Fisher descendant, who will help me answer questions afterwards. Fisher was born in 1794 in Philadelphia, which was the temporary capital of the United States at the time while Washington DC was under construction. His mother died when he was a year old and five of the seven siblings died young, which might explain his somewhat melancholy expression in the portrait. His family were Quakers. His ancestors included two mayors of Philadelphia when it was still a British colony, one of whom was an advisor to Ben Franklin. Franklin was a member of the Quaker political party, but he wasn't a practicing Quaker. Quakers were pacifists, 
and opposed slavery. But Fisher wasn't a pacifist. He served in the War of 1812 when Commodore John Rogers disrupted the British naval blockade of the U.S. East Coast by sending the small American fleet out to sea and drawing the British ships away from the coast, allowing the American merchant ships to get into port safely. Fisher would later apply a similar strategy to break the Mexican naval blockade when he was Secretary of the Navy for the Republic of Texas. In 1818, he married Anne Pleasance. The next year, the family was in Missouri, where Fisher met Stephen F. Austin and began a lifelong friendship. They moved back to Philadelphia, where Fisher became a commissariat in the Navy Yard. Around 1828, the family moved again to, to Tennessee, where his daughter Annie, who's my third great-grandmother, memoirs about beating Sam Houston and Andrew Jackson. They then returned to Philadelphia, where Fisher started a shipping company with business in Texas. And in June 1830, he moved to Texas, decided to join Austin's colony in Mexico, which was part of the state of Coahuila y Tejas in Mexico. He settled in Matagorda, a town at the mouth of the Colorado River, where he became a proprietor, which allowed him to share in the profits from any revenue raised from selling lots or uh, taxes. And relations with Mexico were generally good at the time, so he decided to bring his family. In June or January of 1832, Fisher arrived with his family in Matagorda, expecting to move them into a house, only to discover that his agent had embezzled the money. So they had to make friends quickly. There were only about five homes in Matagorda at the time. But by May, the family was able to move into a house that had been constructed by ship's carpenters. It was built, uh, the walls were built with three layers of cypress oriented horizontally, vertically, and diagonally. And it was built to last. It's one of the oldest homes in Texas. It survived several major hurricanes. It was formerly run as a bed and breakfast by a wonderful couple who's now selling it. And visitors to the house in Matagorda were a who's who of Texas history including Travis, Fannin, Bowie, Archer, Wharton, Jane McManus, who was the first to write about Manifest Destiny in print about America's westward expansion, and Judge Williamson, who is called Three-Legged Willie because his right leg was permanently bent at the knee and he wore a wooden leg, so he would sometimes startle people when he stood up because it was like a third leg was dangling behind him. There weren't any children Annie's age when she moved to Matagorda, so she grew up playing with Karankwa Indian girls, and she wrote in her memoirs about the wild fandango dances that they had on nights of a full moon. In 1833, Fisher became the alcalde, or judge, of Matagorda, and that same year Santa Ana was elected president, and relations with Mexico began to deteriorate. In 1835, Mexico sent two warships into Texas waters to enforce customs laws. And the warship Bravo seized the US merchant ship Martha and its passengers in Galveston Bay and took them down to Matamoros at the tip of present day Texas. It so happened that a US revenue cutter, the Ingham was in Texas waters looking for the illegal slave trade. And the captain of the Ingham took a dim view of Mexico taking U.S. citizens and a U.S. flagship prisoner. So he sailed down to Matamoros and after some exchange of cannon fire, recovered the Martha and its passengers. A newspaper in New Orleans later wrote about the battle and gave the captain and the battle temper paratus, or always ready, which later became the motto for the U.S. Coast Guard. And this battle was the first ever between a U.S. governmental vessel and the Mexican Navy. Then in September, the second Mexican warship, the Correo de Mexico, attacked the U.S. merchant ship San Felipe off the mouth of the Brazos River at Velasco, which is now the, known as Freeport. But the San Felipe and the steamboat Laura turned the tables on the Correo and ended up capturing it. Stephen F. Austin had been a passenger on the Correo, and he had always favored Texas remaining part of Mexico. One of the reasons was that slavery was illegal in Mexico. Austin opposed slavery, although it was tolerated in his colony. And he didn't want Texas joining the United States as a slave state. But this provocation was too much even for him. He supported a gathering of Texas citizens at the capital of his colony in San Felipe to have a consultation to decide what to do. 
But war became inevitable. On October 2nd, the first land battle occurred at Gonzales, the, side, the scene of the famous come and take it flag. And October 17th, Fisher, who was chairman of the committee of Matagora Committee of Safety, issued a proclamation in uh, support of the consultation saying, we shall oppose the ingress of any armed force of Mexicans, no matter in what number, upon what pretext they may come. The military despot at Santa Ana is now overshadowing us. We have no longer any hope but from ourselves. So on November 3rd, the consultation convened in San Felipe, and it came to be known as the Provisional Government of Texas. But Fisher didn't go to the consultation. He saw the need to form a Navy to defend the Texas coast. And so in early November, Fisher and some other citizens of Matagorda personally guaranteed the purchase costs of the schooner William Robbins for the public defense. And this marked the birth of the Texas Navy. Fisher personally guaranteed $500 of that cost, which may not sound like much, today, but in terms of the value, that was equivalent to anywhere from $150,000 to $8 million today. William Robbins became uh, the first Navy warship when it was renamed Liberty. Fisher's foresight was confirmed when on November 17th, the U.S. flag merchant ship Hannah Elizabeth was attempting to bring supplies to the Texan Army when she ran aground in Cavallo Pass, attempting to enter Matagorda Bay and was captured by the Mexican warship Bravo, the same one that had been in the Semper Paratus battle. When word of the capture reached Matagorda, Fisher and 25 volunteers boarded the William Robbins, sailed down to Cavallo Pass, and recaptured the Hannah Elizabeth from the Bravo crew. So this was the first ever uh, action of a, of a Texas Navy ship against Mexico. Meanwhile, back in San Felipe, on November 27th, the provisional governor, Henry Smith, approved a four-ship Navy. Unbeknownst to him, the next day, November 28th, Santa Ana began marching towards Texas with 5,000 soldiers. Santa Ana didn't think Texas had a Navy. He wasn't aware of what Fisher and the provisional government had been up to. On December 5th, the provisional government issued letters of mark and reprisal for the William Robbins. So what these letters did was they allowed privately owned vessels to become privateers, gave them the right to board Mexican flag vessels. And if they found cargo that could be used in the war against Texas, they were allowed to put a prize crew on board the ship, sail it back to Texas. And if a judge agreed it was a valid prize, then the contents would be auctioned and the crew of the privateers would receive 80% of the proceeds, which with the provisional government getting the other 20%. So naturally, this is very popular among the crews of the privateers. In theory, these letters would also protect the officers of the ship from being executed as pirates if they were caught by the Mexican Navy. But of course, when these letters were issued, William Robbins had already taken action against uh, the, the crew of the Bravo a couple of weeks before. The Fisher and the citizens of Matagorda were men of action, and they didn't wait for the protection that these letters would have provided them. On December 26, the government sent three commissioners to New Orleans on the William Robbins to raise money. And then on January 7th, William Robbins became the first warship of the Texas Navy, renamed Liberty. She was bought for $3,500, which was the price that Fisher had negotiated in Matagorda. And by prior arrangement with merchant Thomas McKinney, it was then offered to the provisional government. Liberty was the smallest of the first ships of the Texas Navy. She was about 60 feet long, armed with five guns, and captained by William Brown. In mid-January, Independence became the second ship in the Navy, and she was not other than the Ingham, the ship that had been in the Semper Paratus battle. The U.S. government had sold the Ingham to Gregory Byrne, who turned around and sold it for $5,000 cash to the provisional government. Amazingly, merchants in New Orleans were willing to lend money to the Texas provisional government, even though it was in the process of collapsing by mid-January, but they wanted the right to buy Texas land at 50 cents an acre. Independence became the flagship of the first Texas Navy. She was about 75 by 21 feet with seven guns and had a 10-foot draft and was captained by Commodore Charles Hawkins. On January 22nd, Brutus became the third ship. She was bought on credit from Augustus Allen, who was one of the two Allen brothers who founded Houston. Brutus was 82 by 22 feet with 11 guns and captained by William Hurd. And then in late January, Invincible became the fourth and final ship of the first Texas Navy. She was bought on credit in Baltimore uh, and sold to the government uh, by McKinney and Williams. 
she was a Baltimore Clipper, as you can tell by her slanted or raked masts. She was captained by Jeremiah Brown, who was William Brown's brother. She was about 83 by 21 feet with eight guns and a 12-foot draft. All four of these ships were well suited to operations in the Texas coastal waters, where the water depths on bars in front of uh, entrance to Galveston Bay, Brazos River, or Matagorda Bay could be as shallow as six feet at low tide. The next part of the talk will show a series of maps that demonstrate the crucial role that the Navy played in defeating Mexico. This map is from the book Historic Matagorda County, and on it the movement of General Sam Houston's Texian troops will be shown in light blue, Santa Ana in red, and General Urea in purple. Liberty arrived back in Texas on January 25th with a full crew of 40 sailors that had been recruited in New Orleans with uh, prom where they'd been paid $36 in advance because the Texian government had money at the time and promised land in Texas if they served long enough. When Liberty arrived at Velasco, she found Invincible anchored there without a crew. She'd been sailed to Velasco with a civilian crew from Baltimore who had disembarked on arrival. So Liberty gave half her crew to Invincible, which then sailed back to New Orleans to recruit the rest of the crew. But Liberty didn't wait to uh, replenish the half the crew she'd lost. She took on a few officers and set sail for Mexico with important consequences, as we'll see in a minute. So the foresight of Fisher and the citizens of Matagorda resulted in not only Liberty being the first ship to set sail against Mexico, it also allowed Invincible to become the second, thanks to the crew from Liberty. A few weeks later, in mid-February, Santa Ana marched on San Antonio, crossing the Rio Grande, and General Rea marched up the Texas coast. Meanwhile, a new convention had begun at the town of Washington on the Brazos River to replace the provisional government, which had collapsed. It had 59 delegates, Fisher was one of the delegates from Matagorda, and he signed the Declaration of Independence along with the others on March 2nd. The men that signed this declaration were brave men because Mexico had passed a law making it a crime of treason uh, if you took up arms against Mexico, punishable by death, by execution, and Santa Ana was flying the flag of no quarter. On March 6th, the Alamo's 200 soldiers, defenders, fell to Santa Ana's 2,000 soldiers. Of course, back at Washington on the Brazos, they didn't know the Alamo fell that day, but they knew it was going to fall from Travis's victory or death letter. It was clear that the Alamo was not going to surrender and the men would fight to the death in order to give the rest of Texas time to prepare for the Mexican army. The same day the Alamo fell, 14 sailors from Liberty, which was half of their crew, boarded and captured the Mexican flag vessel Pelicano on the northwest tip of Yucatan at the town of Sisal, where there was an old Spanish fort. There were 36 Mexican soldiers on board the Pelicano, and I think the best way to tell you about what happened is to read an account that was written by Samuel Cushing, who was a soldier on Liberty. He wrote, we let go and pulled cautiously with muffled oars told toward the schooner. We had arrived within 100 yards before he was discovered, but now the loud quien viva of the Mexican sentinel felt harshly upon our ear, followed, before we had time to answer, by a volley of musketry. Give way, boys, shouted Walker, who was Liberty's first lieutenant. Amidst a shower of balls, the boat dashed alongside of the vessel, and in an instant, Walker, cutlass in hand, was upon her deck, slashing right and left, our men wrested a number of muskets from the hand of the enemy and soon put the whole posse to flight. A large number of them jumped overboard and swam for the shore, leaving us in possession of the vessel, and some dozen and a half of their number were disabled or killed. She is ours, shouted Walker. There were no Texian casualties in the taking of the Pelicano. In addition to the supplies and two to three thousand dollars of gold and silver coins that were found on board, there was a hidden cargo that wasn't discovered until later, as we'll see in a moment. A few days later, Invincible set sail to patrol the Texas coast and intercept Mexican supplies. Santa Ana had made a critical error. He'd intended to supply his armies by sea, and the Texas Navy prevented that from happening. Keep in mind that both Invincible and Liberty were sailing under the orders of a government that didn't exist anymore. 
The provisional government had collapsed in mid-January, and neither ship knew what was going on at the new convention in Washington on the Brazos. Their orders from the provisional government were to cruise the Gulf of Mexico when the safety of Texas commerce made it prudent to do so. So that gave the captains wide latitude, and they took it. Here's how William Brown, captain of the Liberty, interpreted those orders. When I see the Mexican flag flying, I shall either take it or be taken. On March 10th, Brutus and Independence arrived from New Orleans, conveying a ship with troops and supplies for the Texian army. They anchored in Matagorda Bay in support of the Texian soldiers near Goliad, which became the first fleet base for the first Texas Navy. On March 3rd, Houston began his retreat from Gonzales with his 375 men in front of Santa Ana's advancing army. And on March 15th, Liberty arrived back from Yucatan with Pelicano. And as Pelicano attempted to enter Matagorda Bay, she ran aground in Caballo Pass. And while they were salvaging her, they discovered 280 kegs of gunpowder hidden in barrels of flour in the Pelicano. So both the gunpowder and the flour would go to the Texian army instead of to Santa Ana's troops. On March 17th, the convention at Washington on the Brazos disbanded and the delegates scattered along with most of the citizens of Texas to the south and east in the face of Santa Ana's advancing armies. That same day in Matagorda, Fisher's family evacuated to the Brutus and Fisher's son Rhodes was carried by his mother on horseback. On the last day of the convention, the delegates elected the officers of the interim government and a man named Robert Potter was elected secretary of the Navy for the interim government. He was a color, colorful character, so it's worth a brief digression to talk about him. Unlike Fisher, Potter had nothing to do with the formation of the Navy, but he played a big role in the convention. He had served in the US Congress he was very active, making motions and appointing people to committees. But uh, at the time he was elected Secretary of the Navy, it was sort of a consolation prize for him. He first tried to run for Secretary of War and was defeated. And of course, on March 17th, the day he was elected, uh, Liberty had already delivered Pelicano with all her supplies to the Texian army. Invincible had already set sail to patrol the coast. Independence and Brutus were already anchored at Matagorda and Potter played no role in any of those events. He had arrived in Texas under a bit of a cloud. He had castrated two of his wife's cousins, a 55-year-old Methodist reverend and a 17-year-old teenage boy. They had been in the habit of visiting the Potter's house to see his wife, their cousin. His wife denied any infidelity when she divorced him and his fellow legislators were so incensed that he'd only served six months for castrating these two men or potterizing them, as it came to be called, that they passed a law making it a crime punishable by death without clergy for castration. Potter only served as the Secretary of the Navy for the interim government for a couple of months, most of that time spent working on the fortifications at Velasco and Galveston. On March 21st, the paper in San Felipe noted that Fisher was passing through San Felipe with Captains Hurd and Hawkins on their way back to their vessels at Matagorda. Fisher had chaired the standing naval committee in the convention that had issued the sailing orders and commissioned uh, the captains of the first U.S. Navy, excuse me, Texas Navy. Then in late March, Fisher reached Matagorda. He, by now, he was a colonel in the Army and he housed 110 New York Army volunteers at his expense in Matagorda, probably at the house you saw earlier in the picture. Tragedy struck the Texan Army again on March 27th when Fannin and 342 Texans who had surrendered, expected to be treated with honor, were instead executed under Santa Ana's orders. And that was half of the Texan Army at the time. But good news came from the sea on March 28th. Two cannons, which came to be known as the Twin Sisters, 400 muskets and powder were delivered by sea. One historical note, the cannons were named after twin girls, one of whom later owned the Fisher's house in Matagorda when she bought it with her husband. On March 31st, Houston was finally able to give some good news to the demor his demoralized army. He proclaimed Liberty's capture of supplies and gunpowder. Then on April 3rd, Invincible struck a blow that quite possibly saved the Republic of Texas. 
She was cruising off of Brazos Santiago Pass, which is the channel between the south tip of Padre Island and the mouth of the Rio Grande at Boca Chica, when she encountered the Bravo. And in this beautiful painting by Peter Rinlisbacher, you can see Invincible putting some cannonballs through Bravo's hull and leaving her aground on a sandbar off South Padre Island. Now, looking at this painting, you may think it looks like two Mexican vessels are battling each other. The reason for that is that both Invincible and Liberty were flying the flags of the provisional government, which had never actually declared independence from Mexico. Instead, they had declared allegiance to the Constitution of 1824, which Santa Ana had nullified. And so Invincible was flying the flag with the Mexican colors and the date 1824. Well, after leaving Bravo on the sandbar, Invincible discovered why Bravo had been outside the bar. The vessel Pocket appeared on the horizon. She was a U.S. flag merchant ship from New Orleans. And when Invincible boarded her, they discovered maps of the Texas coast, supplies for the Mexican army, several Mexican naval officers, and plans to transport 1,000 Mexican troops to Galveston on four ships that were anchored in the harbor. There is a shipwreck near the site of the battle between Invincible and Bravo. It's probably not the Bravo, but it gives you an idea of the size of these ships. They weren't very large. This particular shipwreck is 75 feet by 23 feet, so that's larger than the Liberty, about the size of the Independence. And it's amazing to think that this shipwreck is sitting offshore of Boca Chica, where SpaceX is launching rockets now. So we've gone from the age of sail to the space age in less than 200 years. But these ships were the rocket ships of their day. In less than three days sailing time, Invincible brought Pocket to Galveston, where the refugees camped out on the beach were very grateful for the supplies. As a result of Invincible capturing Pocket and Liberty earlier capturing Pelicano, the Mexican agent in New Orleans suspended shipments from the U.S. to Mexico, where the Texians, of course, could continue to get supplies from the United States. Now, we don't know what would have happened if instead of Invincible arriving with Pocket, it had been the four Mexican ships with a thousand new troops and supplies for Santa Ana's armies. Probably what would have happened is they would have taken the interim governor, government prisoner. They were meeting in Harrisburg, which is present day Eastern Houston, and they were undefended. The thousand new troops would have probably united with Santa Ana and Urrea's forces to create a truly invincible force but thanks to the Texas Navy, that didn't happen. On April 12th, Sam Houston's army crossed the Brazos River, which was at flood stage with the help of the steamboat Yellowstone. But Santa Ana had moved south along the Brazos and it crossed down near uh, the present day town of Richmond. He was making a beeline for Harrisburg to try to capture the interim government. On April 13th, General Urrea occupied Matagorda, but found it deserted. The Texas Navy and other ships in the harbor had evacuated all the citizens of Matagorda. Urrea didn't burn it, which is why you can still uh, stay in Fisher's house in Matagorda. Meanwhile, the steamboat Yellowstone had to steam down the Brazos River past hundreds of Mexican soldiers uh, encamped on its banks. And the captain of the steamboat got a full head of steam, went careening around the bend so fast that the steamboat would make a full circle sometimes before continuing on downstream past the amazed Mexican soldiers, many of whom had never seen a steamboat. And one of them reportedly tried to lasso the smokestacks, but the steam, steamboat managed to get past them out at the mouth at Velasco and on to Galveston. On April 16th, Santa Ana reached Harrisburg the, the interim government had just uh, escaped within uh, sight of the Mexican army. Santa Ana burned Harrisburg. And then the next day, interim president Burnett escaped by the skin of his teeth at New Washington, which is now known as Morgan's Point. Colonel Almonte arrived with the Mexican troops just as Burnett was pushing off from the dock with his family. And Almonte ordered his troops not to fire on Burnett because his wife and child were on the boat. So from there, Burnett went down to Galveston, where he was under the protection of the Navy. So the only protection that the interim government received prior to the Battle of San Jacinto was actually from the Navy, not from the Army. 
Santa Ana himself arrived at Morgan's Point the next day on April 18th, and he found a schooner there that he attempted to take, but a Texian steamboat burned it. Now, the question is, why would Santa Ana want to have gotten us onto a, a schooner? Well, he may have been planning to go down and meet the invasion force and resupply vessels that he was expecting to arrive at Galveston. Some historians have speculated, though, that he was getting ready to get the heck out of Texas, that he'd tired of the land campaign. He was going to leave the mopping up to his generals and go back to Mexico and bask in the uh, glory of his victories at the Alamo and Goliad. But regardless, even if he'd been able to acquire a schooner, he wouldn't have been able to get out the mouth of Galveston Bay because of the Texas Navy warships that were anchored there. So instead, he turned north and met his fate a few days later at San Jacinto, where the Texian army literally caught the Mexican army napping. They attacked at 4.30 during the Mexican army's siesta, and they routed the Mexican army you know, in a battle that lasted only 18 minutes, thanks in part to the fact that they outgunned the army. The command of the Texas coast from the Texas Navy had allowed the delivery of the two tw twin sisters cannons compared to Santa Ana's single cannon. Well, the Texan army certainly understood the role that the Navy had played in their victory at San Jacinto. They voted with their pocketbooks to give $3,000 from Santa Ana's war chest to the Navy. And Brigadier General Theodore Roosevelt Jr. later wrote, it is no exaggeration to say that without the Navy, there would probably have been no Lone Star Republic and possibly the state of Texas would still be part of Mexico. Well, bad new tra news traveled fast to the Mexican army. Only two days after the defeat at San Jacinto, General Filosola began his retreat. Mexicans, uh, the Mexicans still had 3,000, 4,000 soldiers in Texas, but the men were demoralized. Uh, they had been, some of them had been on half rations. They hadn't been resupplied. Their powder was wet from crossing the rain swollen rivers during the runaway scrape. And Filosola felt he had no choice but to retreat. Santa Ana had ordered the retreat, but they were under no obligation to obey his orders since he was a prisoner of war. General Larea later wrote that he opposed the retreat. He never lost uh, a battle on Texas soil, but in the end, they had no choice. Uh, to add insult to injury, in June, 30 mounted Texian soldiers managed to capture three supply ships that were attempting to resupply the Mexican army. But that was too little too late. By June 15th, Filosola had reached Matamoros. It took longer for the news of the victory at San Jacinto to reach the interim government at Galveston. But on April 27th, in this beautiful painting by Peter Rindlisbacher, a rowboat with messengers from San Jacinto fittingly let the Texas Navy be the first to hear about the victory. And this painting shows firing of a long tom cannon to let the interim government and the citizens of Galveston know about the victory. Later that year, in October, the Republic of Texas came into being. Sam Houston was elected the first president of the Republic, and the Constitution was approved. He appointed Fisher as the first secretary of the Navy for the Republic, despite the fact that Fisher had supported his old friend Stephen F. Austin as president. Fisher wrote that the Navy was in a deplorable and crippled condition with debts of about $112,000, uh, Liberty had been seized by creditors in New Orleans after Potter had ordered repairs that the Republic couldn't pay for. And Invincible and Brutus had sailed to New York without permission uh, for a couple of reasons. One, repairs were cheaper in New York than New Orleans. Secondly, and more importantly, there were no creditors in New York to seize the ships yet. Of course, that changed as soon as they arrived. Captain Hurd had to pledge Brutus as collateral in order to pay his crew but he also ordered rum, champagne, sherry, Madeira, and brandy. So life as a Texas Navy captain wasn't all bad. But that le just left independence and four privateers to defend the coast of Texas. Then in December, President Houston canceled the letters of bark and reprisal over Fisher's objection. And this was probably the beginning of the rift between the two men. Houston wanted Texas to become part of the United States and public opinion in the US was running against privateers especially in New Orleans, which is the third largest city in the U.S., and the, where the merchants didn't want their ships being subject to search and seizure by Texan vessels. But independents had to go into New Orleans for repairs, and there was no money 
to pay for a new crew, so that left the Texas coast undefended. On February 11th, Mexico announced a naval blockade of Texas. They'd been watching what was going on. They realized the mistakes of their earlier weak Navy the year before, so they'd gone on a spending spree buying new ships, supplies, and crews. On the same day they announced their blockade, Commodore Hawkins died of smallpox in New Orleans. This flag behind him was the flag that was now being flown by the Texas Navy. It's no coincidence that it looks like the U.S. flag intending to trick the Mexican Navy at a distance. On March 3rd, the Republic got some good news. A year and a day after they declared independence, the United States recognized it as an independent nation. Of course, the Republic claimed land that went all the way up into present-day Wyoming. But in April, Mexico began to enforce its five-ship naval blockade. They immediately captured six ships, including the warship Independence, which had only managed to hire six sailors in New Orleans because of the lack of money. And they were defeated by two larger and better armed Mexican Navy vessels. William Wharton was a returning hero from the United States where he helped to negotiate the recognition of the Republic. He was taken prisoner with the independence, and Houston vetoed the Navy's rescue of Wharton, much to the dismay of Wharton's family, which uh, we'll hear more about in a minute. Meanwhile, the Mexican army was gathering the Metamoros, preparing to reinvade Texas. Mexico didn't recognize the treaties that Santa Ana had signed. So in these dire conditions, on May 23rd, Fisher ordered the Navy, the two remaining ships, on a diversionary cruise to Mexico to break the Mexican naval blockade. He wrote that President Houston required some persuasion to approve the order. Houston felt that the Navy should remain in a defensive posture near port, which of course was a losing proposition since the Mexican Navy outnumbered the Texians eight ships to two. But in one stroke of luck, Fisher was able to get full crews for these two ships because Houston had furloughed most of the army because they were itching to march down to Mexico to attack at Matamoros, and Houston didn't want that to happen. So the Navy was able to recruit 40 uh, armed soldiers with naval experience to join their crews, but that had consequences too, as we'll see in a minute. On June 7th, Houston granted Fisher a leave of absence for health reasons. What he didn't realize was that Fisher intended to volunteer for the cruise while he was on leave. Here's how Fisher justified that. He wrote, we shall stretch to the southward with the hope of falling in with the enemy. I am a volunteer. I have thought for some time about the expediency of personally taking a part with the Navy. I know you gentlemen of systemized government will smile at the idea of the Secretary of the Navy turning sailor, but my opinion is that it will inspire great confidence in the men and stimulate our Congress to do something for us. So the crews made landfall at Cozumel, which they claimed for the Republic of Texas, and uh, visited Cisal, or Cisal, where Liberty had captured Pelicano a year before, before cruising through the Bay of Campeche and up past Veracruz and Tampico back to Texas. Well, Fisher's strategy was successful. The Mexican naval blockade was broken. In the summer of 1837, commerce resumed in Texas. All the Mexican blockading vessels either returned to their ports to defend them or went out looking for the Texian Navy. During the cruise, a Navy landing party was attacked by 20 mounted Mexican soldiers. Fisher had a pistol with him and he shot one of the soldiers off his horse, which allowed the landing party time to get back to their boat and escape. So despite Fisher's Quaker pacifist upbringing, he was obviously a good shot with a pistol. But in retaliation for this attack on their landing party, the sailors and the soldiers who were itching for revenge against Mexico retaliated by burning some villages in the Yucatan. This beautiful painting by Peter Rindlisbacher shows the Texian Navy claiming Cozumel for the Republic of Texas and raising the Texas Navy flag. A hundred years later, another Texan, Admiral Chester Nimitz, said it is the function of the Navy to carry the war to the enemy so that it is not fought on U.S. soil. Fisher certainly understood this concept, but his boss, President Houston, not so much. On August 27th, the cruise ended. Brutus crossed the bar at Galveston with one of the prize ships. But as fate would have it, a merchant ship, the Sam Houston, appeared on the horizon pursued by two Mexican Navy warships. 
Invincible made sure that Sam Houston got across the bar safely and then turned to engage the two larger and better armed ships. Reports of what happened in the battle differ, but the end result was that Invincible ran aground and broke apart overnight. Brutus attempted to come to Invincible's aid, but she ran aground in Galveston Bay at low tide. However, her crew boarded the steamboat Archer and managed to chase away the two Mexican warships. Despite the loss of the Invincible, on September 2nd, Fisher was welcome from the city of Houston in this newspaper article from the Houston Telegraph. It reads, Fisher will be received with the welcoming acclamations of his grateful fellow citizens who have listened to the cheering recital of his achievements with patriotic pride. The gallant tars, that's sailors, with whom he has nobly shared the dangers and privations of this desperate cruise have thrown a new luster around the national flag and accomplished feats of daring valor, which shall long illumine the pages of Texian story. The gratitude of an admiring nation shall dictate his and their reward. The cruise delivered six prize ships and $30,000, but despite the adulation, or maybe because of it, Houston fired Fisher on September 4th, which created a constitutional crisis. Uh, the Senate had a right to approve any changes in Houston's cabinet and many in the Senate thought that Hit Fisher was a hero. So a trial was convened in the Senate to hear President Houston's charges. And that's where it ends, cliffhanger. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, am I back on? Uh, you wanna bring back your, your share screen? Okay, sure. Okay, you, you, that. okay I'll move back to the background. All right. Okay. So before Fisher's trial could convene in the Senate, Mother Nature intervened. Racer's hurricane came churning up the Texas coast, sinking ships all the way from Matamoros to Cape Hatteras. It hit Galveston on October 6th. All the ships in Galveston were destroyed, including the Brutus and the privateer, the Tom Toby. The only ship that survived was the prize ship Phoenix, which was saved by the crew from the privateer, Tom Toby. Uh, that ended the first Texas Navy, except for the Independence, which continued to sail as the Independencia and briefly sailed again for the second Texas Navy in 1843, but that's another story. Fortunately for the Republic of Texas, France captured and blockaded the entire Mexican Navy in the so-called Pastry War of 1838 and 1839, which gave the Republic some breathing room. So Fisher's trial in the Senate convened on November 11th. Houston charged that Fisher had continued to act as Secretary of the Navy while he was on leave. He wrote that Fisher took the effectual control of the squadron. He received the public applause as if rendered to the commander and hero of the cruise therefore responsible for its misdeeds. By misdeeds, Houston's referring in part to the burning of the Yucatan villages, uh, which is a bit hypocritical coming from him considering what soldiers under his command did to Mexican soldiers who were trying to surrender at the Battle of San Jacinto. But regardless, witnesses testified that Fisher not only issued no orders while he was on the cruise, but he refused to give his opinion even when asked. On November 21st, Houston told the Senate that he had authorized the Mexican cruise. So that wasn't one of the charges against Fisher. And on the 28th, the trial concluded, the Senate cleared Fisher of all Houston's charges, but consented to his resignation with honor, since it was obvious that the two men couldn't get along anymore. John Wharton had some choice words to say about Houston on the last day of the trial. Recall that he was mad that uh, Houston vetoed the Navy rescue of his brother, William called Houston that bloated mass of inebriety and insanity, of hypocrisy, vanity, and villainy. When I see him sitting like an incubus and weighing down the hopes and paralyzing the energies of, my infant, of our infant republic, my soul sickens and I turn with horror from the scene. One bystander said that it was the bitterest invective ever uttered by man. Now, some of you may be wondering what an incubus is. It's a demon that molests sleeping women at night and politicians in the early 1800s would have been very aware of what an incubus is because of a famous painting 
that political cartoonists would alter by substituting the face of the incubus with a politician. So here's that famous painting with Wharton's incubus on top of the Republic of Texas. So Fisher's farewell letter to the Republic closed with God prosper Texas and to you, my friends and fellow citizens, happiness and thanks. So with that, I'll open it up for questions with uh, help from my cousin, Admiral Beth Fisher. I will bring uh, Beth, uh, who was mentioned earlier, is uh, another descendant of uh, Mr. Fisher. And welcome, Beth. Hello. Thank you. So a couple of questions. Uh, you know, I kept writing down questions as you spoke, and then you you covered the answers, so they uh, rendered my my questions moot. But uh, one interesting thing we noticed uh, in the picture of um, uh, Commodore Hawkins, what uniform was he wearing? And was there a Texas Navy uniform or was that the Mexican Navy uniform or something else entirely? Yes, good question. Uh, there were uniforms purchased uh, for the Texas Navy and uh, that was thought to be similar to the ones that they actually used. Uh, Beth, you have any other Comments well, on the that. Famous uh, artist Bruce Marshall drew that. He, he was a fine artist major, and he drew all the uniforms of the Texas Navy and the Marines, horse Marines, etc. Yeah, there was a naval base in Galveston that was uh, destroyed during Racer Storm. Uh, although some artifacts from that uh, building apparently have been recovered. Um, but I'm not sure that any uniforms uh, still exist from the actual days of the Texas Navy. That's that'd be a good thing to find out. And then there was another hurricane. What about three decades later? That is the, the 1900. Famous. Yeah, it foreshadowed yeah. the 1900 storm, which was very significant in my family. Uh, my uh, great grandmother died in that hurricane. And my uh, uh, grand well, great grandfather. Uh, just barely survived. It hit on his birthday when he was 16 years old, and he wrote a very moving account of that storm. Yeah, and it wasn't that many years ago that Galveston was underwater yet again. Right. Yeah, well, they, they built, they raised the whole city of Galveston 16 feet and built a seawall. So since then, the damage has not been nearly as bad as from 1900. But you're referring to Hurricane Ike, which took the path of the 1900 storm, and it did cover the island almost completely with water again. That that was my recollection. The strand was underwater, and and most of the island was was under, pretty much underwater. Not as much. Uh, Not like it would have been without the uh, seawall, like Dallum said, and raising of the island. Right. And interestingly, it was it was one of Fisher's descendants that was the uh, county judge or basically mayor of Galveston at the time the seawall was built. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, did uh, Secretary Fisher live to see the Mexican-American War, 1846 to 1848? No, he was, no, he was sadly assassinated in Mat Matagorda in 1839. Well, what's the story behind that? Well, one of my uh, other cousins, uh, Diana Compton, has written an account of that, which I encourage you to uh, look up on the internet. I believe it's called... Uh, once Upon a Time in Matagorda, I think. Uh -huh. On Google um, Scholar. It's an excellent account. Yes. It's and the so, who done um, it. From since a she can't there. talk uh, live here, I'll go ahead and do my best to, to tell at least the highlights of the story. Uh, Fisher was in a tavern, and somebody asked him what was up, and he said that, well, he was going to uh, fight a damned fool the next day, probably someone that he was planning to duel. And just then a shot rang out and shot him in the back, quite possibly the man that he was planning to duel, who maybe had heard what a good shot with the pistol Fisher was. And they did indict uh, a man, but uh, he was not uh, he was not actually charged. The grand jury declined to charge him. So we don't really know what happened. There's no records from the grand jury. Are there any historical records on what turned Sam Houston so sour on... Uh... Secretary Fisher? Well, he turned sour on a lot of people, not just Secretary anybody, Fisher. <laughs> anybody almost that had any kind of 
uh, success. Yeah, for instance, uh, Sidney Sherman, who's one of the heroes of San Jacinto, Houston later turned on him and called him a coward, as well as yeah. Wharton and, and other people. Uh, you know, can only speculate uh, what happened. Houston was obviously very upset that Fisher had news without telling him, although Houston uh, apparently did realize at some at one point, right before he left, that Fisher was going to go on the cruise. And he was possibly jealous of the uh, acclamation that Fisher received, you know, returning home. So, so you're suggesting that the casting of Richard Boone as Sam Houston in the movie, The Alamo, um, was probably spot on. <laughs> uh, yeah, no comment. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I don't see any other questions. I'll give everybody a chance going once. Going twice, hearing none, I want to thank you both for being with us this evening. Again, the YouTube recording will be posted. Uh, for the moment, the easiest way to get it is on our YouTube channel, um, Continental Commandery's YouTube channel. And you just go to the Continental Commandery website and look at either uh, for the next few days, upcoming events, and then it'll get migrated over to past events. But if you go to the past events page and YouTube channel at the top of the page, the recording of this, a YouTube recording of this will be available there. Um, and next month, uh, our plan presentation may be literally up in the air. Um, it appears that our speaker has uh, fallen off the radar and it may be because he was just recalled to active duty um, and is cruising somewhere in the Eastern Mediterranean. So we'll uh, update everybody through the weekly all NOUS plan of the day. I will also post an update to the commandery's LinkedIn page. So watch for news there. Um, couple of compliments uh, from our uh, listeners. Thank you, Jim. Um, and since Jim posted, thank you, Dave. Uh, Dave and I are old shipmates, and I mean that in all sense of the word. In the early 80s, we were shipmates together over in Texas at Fleet Training Group San Diego Detachment 210. Um, <clears throat> Jim has uh, presented uh, uh, from a different part of the country, um, or different part of the world, a kerfuffle over the Norwegian Sea. You can find that on our YouTube channel. And Jim's opus about his life in the Navy will soon be posted in our oral history page. With that, I want to wish everybody a, a good evening. If you're uh, east of Eastern Seaboard, good afternoon if you're on the Pacific Coast. And look forward to seeing many of you back in uh, uh, November, we hope. And again, I'll keep you posted. We may have a pre-recorded presentation in November from one of our Italian companions. So uh, we will be adapting, improvising, and overcoming. I want to thank you all. And with that, we will end the recording.